Hello, uh, and thank you all for coming to uh, this installment in the series of presentations that I've been doing at the uh, Hopkinton Senior Center now for the last several years. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I do, I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us at Myrick O'Connell. There are uh, 40 in Worcester and about 20 in uh, Westboro. Uh, because there are so many of us, everybody gets to really focus on the specialty that they do the best, and this is what I do. I do elder law. And these presentations are really designed to try to speak to um, the issues that I find come up the most when I'm talking to folks. Um, because my, my median client age is uh, now about 74. Uh, so I'm dealing primarily with people who are retiring, retired, trying to deal with these issues. And I decided to do this presentation because probably the most common question that I get at the beginning of a meeting with a new client is, so do I need a trust? And I'll ask people, I'll say, well, so why do you ask that question? Well, you know, my neighbor's got a trust and they said, I really have to have a trust. Or my daughter called me and said, you know, I really need a trust. Um, and the, so the answer to the question, do you need a trust, depends on kind of what your problem is. Because the purpose of a trust is to solve problems. And if depending on what your problem is, you may or may not need one, and it may vary in terms of what kind of trust you have, right? Now, my clients typically look a lot like Frank and Mary. They often have a, fa a family that looks a lot like Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., their children, and their goals are usually pretty straightforward. They wanna live in their house until they die, and they wanna be buried in the backyard. That's kind of their general goal in life. Um, and then they wanna leave things to their kids. And so the question is, in that situation, do they need a trust? So before I start, though, I want to talk a little bit, I want to do a couple of definitions. So there are many ways of, of, of defining categories of trusts. One very common one is there are revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts, or revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts. If you look in the dictionary, both of those pronunciations are okay. So you commonly hear them both, and lawyers argue about this, but they're both all right. What is the difference? So the best way to illustrate the difference, if I had, say I had $1,000, and I wanted to give it to you. I wanted to give it to you. Well, the way that I could do that is I could hand you the $1,000. And as long as I had the intention to give that money to you, that is a donative intent, and you took it from me, uh, and so I delivered it to you and you took it from me, that would be a valid gift legally. The reason why that is of some significance is if, if the next day I said I wanted the money back, you wouldn't have to give it to me because I executed a valid gift. I had donative intent, I had delivery to you, and you had receipt. So that's one way that I could give you that $1,000. Another way, though, uh, if I were concerned that somebody might sue you and get that $1,000, or that your wife might try to take it, or for any number of other reasons, or I thought you were kind of not competent to handle it, is I could ask some third party to act as a trustee, to be the holder of that money um, for the benefit of you. Uh, the trustee, a trust is not a, does, uh, is not a separate legal person the way corporations and limited liability companies are. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who has the legal owner of, is the legal owner of something, um, and the beneficiary. Now, going back to my example, if I gave you a money in trust to hold for somebody else, uh, oftentimes I would describe how, the way in which you were supposed to hold it for them in some kind of written document. Sometimes I wouldn't, but you, know, you don't have to, right? But, 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 but usually I would. Uh, and I would describe this in a written document. And then, and I would, and unless that document specifically says that this trust, uh, based upon which I've given you money to hold for this other person, is, um, is irrevocable, uh, I can revoke the trust at any time. What does that mean? It means I can get the money back. I can call you and say, you know that thousand that you were supposed to be holding for your friend or your daughter or whatever? I want you to give me that money back um, because, because I've revoked the trust and gotten the money back. If, if, on the other hand, there is something in the trust document that says that this, 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 this money that I put into trust is in an irrevocable trust, well, then I can't get it back. Now, the most common place that I hear discussions about revocable versus irrevocable trusts um, is people are telling me that, well, you know, I really, 
I think I want to protect my assets. I want to put everything into an irrevocable trust. And that way, five years later, Mass Health can't take it. Well, um, that's partially right. Uh, if, if instead of giving your assets away and waiting five years in order to make sure that Mass Health can count those assets as your assets when you're trying to qualify for Mass Health, if you put the money into an irrevocable trust, um, then, then, you're, then, then it may be that that money is safe, but maybe not, because the question isn't whether the trust is irrevocable. The question is, is it irrevocable and unamendable, and do you have any rights to those assets? If the assets are in an irrevocable trust, but you still have the right to get them back according to the terms of that trust, because, or if you can change the rules of that trust because the trust is amendable, so that you can amend the trust and get it back, well then, as far as Mass Health is concerned, you still are in control of those assets, even though they're in an irrevocable trust. So that's revocable and irrevocable trusts. One other distinction, testamentary trusts and inter vivos trusts. A testamentary trust is one that is part of a will. You have a will in which you say, you know, I want to leave some, something to this one and something to that one, and this other money that I want to leave um, typically, if you're doing this for mass health protection purposes, you want to leave it to your spouse so that these assets are going to be safe in the event that she needs nursing home care. You would say, well, the assets that I would have left to my spouse, instead I'm going to leave them in trust and I'm going to name one of my kids or somebody else as the trustee of that trust for the benefit of my spouse. That is a testamentary trust. It's a trust that's part of the will. Um, Every other trust, every trust that's not a testamentary trust is called an inter vivos trust, a trust between living people, as opposed to a trust that kicks in uh, at the time that you die. That's really what a will does. So a will is always revocable and amendable because you can always change your will until you die, at which point it becomes irrevocable because you can't take it back because you're dead, and then unamendable because you're dead and you can't change, therefore the will can't be changed. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to talk about some situations in which Frank and Mary find themselves. But first, I'm going to grab some water because I realize it's early in the morning and uh, I'm not going to make it here. Uh. So Frank and Mary, uh, that's their goal. And here's their basic estate plan. Um, they want, Frank leaves, wants to leave everything to Mary. Mary wants to leave everything to Frank. And they've both agreed that when the two of them have died, they want everything liquidated, that is, turned into money and divide it up among their kids. That's like a pretty common basic estate plan. So implicit in that plan though, um, there is, some, there is some, something else. There are these people that they don't want to leave the money to. They don't really want to leave anything to the Department of Revenue or the IRS or the nursing home or Mass Health. There are a set of players that they don't want to inadvertently put in their will. Because I often tell people, I've yet to see a person that told me in their will, I really want to leave $100,000 to the IRS. Or that nursing home was terrific, you know, and so I really want to leave a million dollars to the nursing home. So um, one of the goals in, in my practice is, is to make sure that the money goes where Frankie and Mary want it to go, which also means keeping it from leaking out to these other places where they don't want it to go. So the question is, if you're Frank and Mary and you're 65, say they come in and they've got these assets. They've got a house that's owned jointly by the two of them. It's worth about $300,000. Frank has an IRA worth 150, they have an annuity, Frank owns the annuity, Mary is the beneficiary. I always find the annuities to be, it's kind of ironic that the person who is the owner of the annuity and actually is getting the money from the annuity is typically not called the beneficiary, it's called the annuitant. The beneficiary is usually the person who is named to receive things when the annuitant dies. So in this case, Mary is the beneficiary and they have savings of $250,000 which is also joint total assets of about $800,000. So the question is, what are they concerned about? So they, at that age, may not be so concerned about nursing home issues. Why? Uh, because most people in nursing homes for long periods of time are there because they have dementia. Um, they have are trouble remembering things, like it, in some, at the end, kind of remembering how to put on their clothes and remembering how to uh, use the toilet and stuff like that. And so, they, they, folks with dementia, may need long-term care in a nursing home. So Alzheimer's is the number one cause of that, that set of symptoms, causes about 70% of the cases of dementia. Uh, and if you're 65 years old, your chances of getting Alzheimer's are about one in nine. If you're 85 years old, your chances are one in three. 
um, because by that point, you, if, if, you, if you're still standing, that means you didn't die from something else. So the total population of people left at that point right, is kind of shrunk down. And so the likelihood that you're going to end up with dementia, which typically hits older people, keeps getting higher and higher. So if you're 65, you're not really worried about those. You may not be worried about those issues. And I tell people, you know, the, the goal of, of estate planning when you get older is you want to sleep well at night. Right? I mean, you know, at that point, you get to a point where fame and fortune is kind of like not the issue anymore, right? You just want to sleep well. And so the question is, what helps you sleep at night? And if this bothers you, well, then you should take care of it. But if it doesn't, well, then don't, right? So for these folks, they may not be worried about this. Um, they may um, come in saying, well, you know, I don't want to spend any extra money on taxes. I don't want to give money away. But, but unless their estate is worth more than a million dollars, there is no estate tax on their estate. When one of them dies and leaves everything to the other, in any event, there's a 100% marital deduction. We're going to talk about this a little later, but when the second spouse dies, that spouse has less than a million dollars in their taxable estate. There is no estate tax, which leaves them with, with a third issue. This issue, they also don't want to waste money or time on lawyers, right, and on the probate court system. And so often they'll tell me that they want to avoid probate. Um, now, that's not a, that's not a, a bad goal. Um, because in, in, but by the way, this is their situation, right? They own, they own their assets jointly. Frank's got the IRA, Mary, they, Frank's got the annuity. If, if Frank dies, if Frank dies in this situation, um, how many people think there needs to be a probate um, of Frank's estate? Raise your hand. None. How many think that there does not need to be a probate in this situation? Raise your hand. Ah, four, you're correct. Um, when, when you own something jointly with somebody, legally, you own 100% of it. And so does the other person. And when one of you dies, your, hundred, your interest in the property simply evaporates, leaving the other person as the sole owner. So anything you own jointly with someone is not going to have to go through probate. Frank's IRA, Frank thinks he owns that, but he doesn't really. He gets these bank statements from, or from Fidelity or whatever saying he's got this money, but it always says custodian for at the top because it's really the bank or the fidelity or whatever that owns that asset. Frank simply has rights to it. Uh, and, and among other things, the right to name a death beneficiary, like a life insurance policy. So as long as Frank is named a death beneficiary for that, and he did on the, on the annuity, um, if Frank dies, there isn't going to be the necessity for probate. But why are you concerned about probate in the first place? Well, the reason, there's twofold. One, um, if I die, leaving something that is just in my name, and not jointly owned with anybody else, um, then the question is, who gets it? Uh, and the answer is, um, if you have a will, whoever you wrote about in your will gets it. Uh, if the second spouse has died, everything gets divided among the children. That's exactly what happens in the case of a will. The issue, though, uh, and by the way, that, for that reason, you don't, you're never avoiding probate by having a will. Right? And people will tell me that. I don't, I'm not going to go through, I have a will. No. The will simply says the way in which the property is going to be divided up once it's gone through probate. But the other reason for probate is to make sure that all the creditors get paid. Because your creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the probate estate. Now, that is actually, from some perspectives, a very short statute of limitations. The statute of limitations is the period of time during which you can sue somebody if you have some kind of claim against them. So for example, if I run over you with my car today uh, and you get hurt, uh, you have three years from today to sue me. If on the other hand, I run over you and then uh, I hit a stone wall and die, you only have one year to sue my estate. So actually from your perspective, this is a short statute of limitations. Of course, from the perspective of the, of the children or the wife, it's a very long statute of limitations. Everyone's got to wait for a year before any of these assets can be distributed. So, and then going through the probate process means going to probate court. There are special courts that deal with these issues and filing a lot of documents and going back to court and going back and forth with them oftentimes may delay selling the house. So there may be some reasons in terms of legal fees, right, that you may cost you five or $10,000, and especially in terms of delays for wanting to avoid probate. So um, once again, if Frank died 
in this situation, there would be no probate um, it, because of those assets. But then if Mary died, um, in, in this situation, would there be a probate? Suppose Mary died. Frank was already dead. Uh, how many people think there needs to be a probate in that case? Two or three. How many don't think there needs to be a probate? Uh, one. Well, in this case, there, there does, right? Because that home that was joint with Frank and, the, and the, uh, the cash that was joint with Frank, those aren't joint anymore. Mary is the sole owner. So now someone needs to figure out who gets the assets. Okay? So there may be a need for going through probate. Now, for that very reason and because of what we just talked about, there may be other ways to avoid probate. Um, once again, with that situation of assets, among other things, Mary could name death beneficiaries uh, on some of her accounts. She may be able to go to the bank and name the kids as death beneficiaries. And some banks will allow multiple beneficiaries. Some won't. They'll only allow one death beneficiary. Um, or she may be able to put those assets into, into joint names with her kids. She may be able to add her kids to the na her name on the bank accounts or on the deed. Uh, and then, of course, upon her death, her interest would expire and there would be no need for probate. But of course, the problem with that uh, is that every one of those people is 100% the owner of the property. So any one of her kids could go to that bank at any time and take the money because they are 100% owner. And if anybody wanted to sue that child, well, then they could attach that money because the money is owned, is owned by them, right? Um, similarly with the house. You know, the problem with deeding this interest in the house is that at that point, everybody is the joint owner on the house. And if you want to do anything with the house, well, then there's really a problem. So there's that possibility. There's a kind of a version of that, which is called a life estate, that in real estate, at any time, I, if I wanted to, could transfer to somebody else um, the ownership of the property, but keep a life estate in the property, keep the right to be in the house and get rent from the house and the obligation to maintain it and pay the bills until I die. And then at the moment of my death, my interest evaporates, my life estate evaporates, and those other people to whom I deeded the property, called the remainder men, would receive the remainder, that is the ownership of the property. And that may be a solution, and, and you may know people who have done that. They've actually, especially in, case, in the case of their house, they may have transferred their house to their kids, kept a life estate. That, and that's a, a very economical way of, of dealing with that property and avoiding probate. I'll give you two possible problems, though, with that. One, uh, these both came from clients, actually, on, on uh, Martha's Vineyard. I do a lot of work on Martha's Vineyard. And this one lady called me uh, because she was concerned. Uh, she had done this. She had one son. Her husband was dead. She had one son. She had deeded this remainder interest to her son, kept a life estate. It was a number of years before. It had been more than five years, so she, she knew that her house was going to be safe for mass health purposes. But she said she had a concern. Her son just called her and said her, he just got served with divorce papers by his wife. Was this a problem? And I said, well, yes, actually, that is a problem because your son owns the remainder interest in the property. Um, and in terms of how much value is attributed to the remainder, the older you get, the smaller the value attributed to the life estate and the more retributed to the remainder. In her case, she was over 80. Uh, the value attributed to the remainder was about 80% of the value of her $600,000 house. And so all of a sudden, that value was going to be part of that divorce proceeding. Right? That's not good. Second example, another couple um, uh, who had lived in Boston for many years and then moved to or had a cottage in Oak Bluffs. Um, to, on, the, on the vineyard to which they moved when they retired, but they wanted their house to be safe, and so they transferred the remainder interest in the house to their four kids. Um, they kept a life estate, and that was 20 years ago, so the house is safe for mass health purposes, but now they're still feeling good. They want to move back to Boston uh, because their income is okay, but you know, they don't have a lot of savings, and their grandchildren are in Boston, and, but their the other kids are. And so they called their kids because they wanted the kids to deed back to them the remainder interest in the house so that they could go sell the house. And three of them would, but one of them wouldn't. And so they said, well, what do I do? And I said, well, there's nothing you can do, right? That child owns an interest and no one is going to buy your house without all of the remainder interest back. And they said, well, and, and so they said, well, do we, what other, you know, I said, you could sue. 
you could go to, to court and get a, uh, do a petition to partition the real estate in which the court would force a sale of the property and give everybody their share, but your share is just your life estate share. It's that 20% of the value of the house. It's not the whole house. And I said, well, what about, could we get a reverse mortgage? And I said, well, well, yeah, as long as everybody signs, because if I'm the bank, I want everybody to sign, right? Well, that son's not gonna sign. So there may be problems with doing that. Finally, uh, Mary could do a trust. And this is the most common situation where um, someone will do a revocable and amendable trust. Mary could create a trust, naming herself as the trustee for the benefit of herself and the children as the beneficiaries. She could say that the, the, the trust is revocable at any time, so she can always take the property back. It's amendable at any time, so that if she wants to change who the beneficiaries are going to be later on, she can. Um, but in the meantime, she keeps complete control. Then she would say, following her death, that, uh, that, uh, that in place of her, she would name someone else as a trustee, typically one or more of the kids. Warning, avoid ties. Don't name two kids, because if you get two kids and they get into a disagreement, who's going to figure it out, right? So you want to name an odd number or name a tiebreaker in that situation. So she could name one or more of the kids and say, when I die, I want, I want you, the new trustee, to sell the property and divide up the money. And literally, the day after Mary died, that's what they could do. They could sell the property and divide up the money. So that, that may be her best solution. She keeps control while she's alive. She avoids probate and following, therefore following her death. Her kids can liquidate the property very simply. She could also do that with her larger bank accounts. Just name herself as the trustee of a trust. For tax purposes, uh, this trust is a so-called grantor taxable trust. It is a trust that the IRS and the Department of Revenue simply don't kind of acknowledge exists. So for tax purposes, Mary remains the owner of the house. If she sells the house, she still gets her capital gains exemption. When she dies, for tax purposes, the tax basis in the property jumps to the date of death value. It, everything happens the same way as if she simply owned the property. So that's a revocable and amendable trust. So now take Frank and Mary. But say that they're still age 65, and they've got the same kind of assets, but they're worth more. So look, the house is now worth 400,000. The savings went up to 550. Total assets are worth a million too. So now, they're still not really worried about the nursing home issues, um, but they have a tax problem. If Frank dies, Frank can leave everything to Mary, and there will be a 100% estate tax marital deduction. When Mary dies, though, if Mary owns those assets and dies the next day with $1,200,000 in assets, there will be an estate tax. The estate tax on a taxable estate of $1,200,000 is $49,040. So if the estate had been a million or less, then the estate tax would have been zero. Because it's over a million, the estate tax, there's a fairly substantial estate tax basically on that marginal money, that extra money that's over a million. As a matter of fact, the initial uh, tax rate on, a, state, on a, a, a taxable estate over a million dollars is 40 percent, 4-0, 40%. And it stays 40 percent until you get to about a million one hundred twenty thousand dollars, at which point it drops way down. But the point is, for, for estates that are just over, the kind of marginal rate, the rate you're paying on those extra dollars over is really pretty high, right? So the question is, is there a way that Frank and Mary can avoid that? And the answer is yes, by using a trust. Um, uh, and and we'll, we'll call it, for want of a better term, a tax, an estate tax um, avoidance trust. Some people will call it a, 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 a um, credit shelter trust or a family trust. There are a million names for this. But I'm gonna, I want to explain to you basically kind of the theory behind it, what's going on. And these trusts can be created during Frank and Mary's lifetime and funded during their lifetime, or they can kick in and, therefore, and be revocable and amendable during their lifetime and only become irrevocable at death, or they, the Frank and Mary cannot do that during their lifetime and simply put these trusts into their wills, in which case they are testamentary trusts, which are also revocable and amendable until they die. After they die, everything gets ir irrevocable and unamendable. So the way this works, the goal of the exercise for Frank is to make sure that some of the money that would have gone to Mary if he dies, thereby pushing her estate upon her death above a million dollars, 
doesn't and goes someplace else. Now, one thing he could do upon his death is he could simply give that money to his kids. Because remember, in addition to giving Mary an infinite amount, he can give up to a million dollars to other people without there being um, an estate tax because there's no taxable, as long as the taxable estate doesn't go above a million. But he may not want to do that because he may want to make sure Mary, his big goal is to make sure Mary's going to be okay. Right? And if there's anything left over at the end, that's great for the kids, but he's really, he wants to make sure Mary's okay. So what he could do is he can take some piece of his assets, um, and, 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 and by the way, he can take as much as a million dollars of, of his assets, right? Because he can do a, an a, a taxable estate of up to a million dollars tax-free and put them into a special trust. And the rules of that trust will be the beneficiaries would be um, his wife and his children. Uh, they can be anybody he wants, but in this case, we'll make them his wife and his children. Um, no distributions, no early distributions to the children are required. And Mary, who is one of the beneficiaries, can also be the trustee. She could be in control of this money and able to give it to herself while she's alive. But because it's in this magic trust, for tax purposes, the money in that trust is not considered to have been given to Mary and therefore is not part of Mary's taxable estate when she dies. The result, remember those are the assets, is that if Frank dies, suppose he simply took his house. Remember the house was worth $400,000? Suppose he said, well, all of my liquid assets I want to give to Mary, but the house I'm going to put in trust. And I'm going to name Mary as the trustee of the trust, so she has total control, right? And she can sell it if she wants during her lifetime and turn it into cash and give herself the money. Um, but it's in trust. And therefore, for tax purposes, my taxable estate, I have a taxable estate. I didn't give everything to Mary. My taxable estate is $400,000, which is the value of the house. And if Mary dies the next day, her taxable estate is now not a million two, it's only 800,000, because it doesn't include the house, which was in trust. So th through this mechanism, when Mary dies, her estate is 800,000, so there's no tax. Similarly, to take the reverse, say that Mary decided, they decided to use this scheme in order to keep from being taxed, and Mary made sure that upon her death, right, the cash, the money in the, the $550,000 was in a trust account or was in her own name and passed through a testamentary trust into this, into this trust for Frank's benefit. Frank's the trustee, can get to the money anytime, doesn't have to go to the kids. Upon Mary's death, though, as a result, Mary's taxable estate is $550,000, the amount of the cash. If Frank dies the next day, he has the rest, $650,000. The two of them add up to a million, too. And his is below $100,000, so he can avoid taxation. So the, the, this, this trust mechanism is just a, a way, in this case, to avoid the estate tax. Now, these need to be set up before the first of the two of them dies, right? Because once one dies, if they've left everything to the other one, right, if Mary has an estate of a million two, she's kind of stuck with it, right? Whereas if they have structured things so that Mary held most assets herself but had some of them as the trustee of this trust, they would have avoided the estate tax and Mary would still be in control. So that's another case where you would use a trust. Now, once again, these trusts would be revocable and amendable. Um, while the first person, while both of them were alive, when the first person died, their trust, whether it is in their will or in a separate document, would become irrevocable and unamendable. Okay. Now let's go back to Frank and Mary with that smaller amount of assets. But now they're 85. Now they're not 65, and so they are worried about nursing home issues, and so they're trying to figure out how to deal with that issue. How can they make sure? they're going to be safe if someone goes into a nursing home. So, in order to understand this, you've got to understand Mass Health 101. I'm going to give Mass Health 101. If you've been to my presentations, you may have heard this part before. Um, if you haven't, or if you have, well, this is a little review. See if you still remember how this works. So, if Frank and Mary are both alive, and Mary needs nursing home care, uh, how many people here think that Mary is going to, they're going to need to spend down some assets before they can qualify for MassHealth. Remember, they've got, they've got all those assets that we've listed before. How many think that she needs 
They'll need to spend down some assets. Uh, how many think they're going to be able to, she's going to be able to qualify for Mass Health right away? Uh, you're right. You're right. She can qualify not quite right away, but maybe after a couple of days. The reason for that is that while Mary, in this situation, cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets, right? She can actually own the house, but if she owned the house and Frank were dead, um, then Ma Mass Health would put a lien on that house to get repaid. But at this point, she can have these assets, but Frank can own the house. As long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, he can have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220. And most importantly, he can have infinite income, infinite income. So if Mary went into the nursing home today and Frank came into the office and said, oh my God, I didn't do anything. What am I going to do? I'd say, well, this is fairly straightforward. We're going to have you, uh, Mary transfer everything to, 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 um, to Frank, right? We're then going to have Frank buy an annuity with all of the money that puts him over $119,220. As long as that annuity, an annuity is simply a contract with an insurance company. You pay him some money and they agree in return to pay you back some money, typically with some interest. In this case, the interest rates are terrible. So you'd never do this if it weren't for the fact that you're trying to qualify someone for mass health. They're actually called, if you call the companies, mass health qualifying annuities, as a matter of fact, Medicaid qualifying annuities. So as long as Frank buys an annuity with this extra money that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and his <laughs> 5.84 years. Uh, that comes from a table that MassHealth uses. No matter how sick he is, it makes no difference, right? That's, if he buys his annuity at that age, that's his life expectancy. As long as the payments are equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Mary has conveyed all her assets to Frank, and Frank has bought the annuity, Mary can qualify for Mass Health because now she has less than $2,000, he owns the house, he has cash of less than 119220 and remember, his income doesn't count. By the way, that's typically why, um, oh, it, it, a couple of things related to this. Uh, one, that only has to be true at the moment that Mary qualifies for Mass Health. Frank can have more assets than that the next day. Frank can hit the lottery the day after Mary qualifies for Mass Health, and Mary still stays on Mass Health, which is the reason why typically when we're doing a structure like this, we would advise Frank to buy an annuity to spend his assets down to maybe like $100,000, so that even with the annuity payments coming in, um, because Mary isn't going to qualify for Mass Health right away, we've got to file the application, there's going to be papers to go back and forth. We need to keep him below $119,220 until Mary has qualified, right? So Mar Frank can, Mary can qualify for mass health at any time as long as Frank's not dead. But if Frank dies and they haven't restructured their assets somehow so that Mary inherits all the assets, well now of course Mary goes to the nursing home, she's got a problem. She's way over asset, right? So all of the IRA is going to have to get Frank's IRA, which is now in her name, is going to have to get cashed in. The annuity, all the savings has to be spent on the nursing home until she's down below $2,000. And then she'll qualify, but MassHealth will put a lien on that house to make sure that following her death, MassHealth gets repaid. So the question, if you're 85 years old and you're in this situation, and I talked to a guy about this this morning before I came over here, this is exactly the question. Wife has got early stage dementia. He's worried about her. What am I going to do? Is we have all of the assets shifted to Frank, right? Before he dies, and it doesn't have to happen way before he dies, but before he dies. But we need to make sure that, he, that at that point he has a will that has these terms to it. It has to contain a testamentary, the money that was going to go to Mary needs to instead to go in a testamentary trust, a trust that's part of the will, for Mary's benefit. He can name one or more of the kids as the trustees, right? The money in the trust can be used to supplement Mary's care in any way. If at any time Mary, if Frank dies and Mary isn't in the nursing home and is just still around and says, oh, well, you know, I, wanna, I want some of that money, that's okay, the trustee can give it to her. The trustee can give her 
$10,000, $50,000, whatever she needs. Now, if Mary then needs to go into a nursing home, that money, the money that she just got, is going to have to get spent down to less than $2,000. But all the rest is going to be safe. All the money in the testamentary trust is going to be safe. So, and and they, Frank can specify that upon his death, all these assets are going to go to the kids. Right? And they're lien free. Mass Health has no lien on any of this. Okay? So, in this case, a testamentary trust for the benefit of a spouse makes a lot of sense. That testamentary trust remains revocable until Frank has died because you can always change your will. And by the way, if Frank and Mary came into me and they were both still pretty healthy, I'd say, well, you both want to do this because you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, I've had emergency cases where literally you know, the, the wife and husband came in and the wife was really stressed out because she was dying of cancer and the husband had early stage dementia. And she was like, well, this isn't going to be good. She, they came in with the one daughter. What are we going to do? I said, this is very simple. We're going to have you change your will to say that upon your death, everything goes to your daughter and trust for the benefit of your, your, your father, the, of, the, of the husband. Um, and that's what we did. And then we transferred all the assets to her. And upon her death, which she died two months later, everything was safe. And I, went, I don't want to say she was happy because she was dying, but, but she was sleeping better knowing that her husband was going to be safe. Okay? So that's the place in which a testamentary trust is very often used. And it's a testamentary. Now, can you do this using an inter vivos trust, a trust that you set up before you die for the benefit of the kids? No, you can't. The trust in this case has to be testamentary. The reason for that is that's the way the federal law is written. The loophole that is allowed in the federal law only applies to testamentary trusts. Um, Finally, <clears throat> what if Frank has died and they didn't do any of that and Mary now owns all the assets and she comes into me and she says, oh my God, or she comes into me typically with one of her kids or more and now they want to make sure that the assets are safe if Mary needs nursing home care later on in life. And I tell her, too bad you didn't talk to me before Frank died, right? Because at this point everything would now be safe. But if that's not the case, if, if Mary is a widow or divorced and wants to have some of her assets protected in the event that she needs nursing home care, in that case, she, can, she, she, needs, to, she needs to give them away and wait five years. She can do what I said at the beginning of this presentation. She can just give them away. She can give these assets to her kids or she could transfer an, a, an, a remainder interest in her house to her kids and keep a life estate. Or she could create an irrevocable trust. Name one or more of her children as the trustee of that irrevocable trust. She can't be a beneficiary of this trust as to any significant interest in the trust. Otherwise, Mass Health is going to say it's still hers. So the beneficiaries have to be the kids. She can't be the trustee of the trust. The children, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the children, that's why she was coughing. I'm dry too. It's dry here, right? Um, the, 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 the children can retain, in this case, the right to distribute some assets to themselves so that if Mary then needs nursing home care and all the assets are in trust, the kids can make distributions to themselves of these assets as beneficiaries and then turn around and give them back to their mother or use them on their mother's behalf. That back door uh, is the reason why these kinds of trusts uh, it, it had been challenged a lot by Mass Health over the last few years. And recently we were concerned, and I know I've mentioned it here, I mentioned it I think last spring, that there were some, a couple of superior courts that had upheld decisions by Mass Health saying that that kind of trust in which there is a way for the kids to get the money out and then give it back to their parents um, uh, was not valid and that those assets were countable. Fortunately, that got straightened out this year. There was a case that went to the appeals court. There was an appeals court decision saying that that specific device in a trust does not render the trust invalid. So those things can be done. So there is a, that is the one and only place. I strike that. There are, that is one of the three places where we talk to folks about irrevocable trust. Typically, we don't because people don't want to lose control of their assets and shouldn't if they not have to, right? And only in this case do you have to lose control. The only other times we talk about it, people will say, well, what if both spouses need nursing home care at the same time? 
Well, in that case, we can't transfer the assets from one spouse to the other because they're both in the nursing home. So in that case, if they wanted something protected, they would need to transfer things to an irrevocable trust and wait five years. I tell people, though, I have been doing this work, it will be 40 years in January. I have only seen that happen twice. In both of those cases, people were in their mid-90s. Uh, and in neither case did either of them live very long. So it didn't have a hugely negative impact on them. Um, the other case where you need the irrevocable trust uh, is if you have a vacation home. So as I explained to you, if in the Frank and Mary case, if Mary needs nursing home care, we, all we do is we transfer everything to Frank and then Frank turns everything into cash except the house and then goes and buys an annuity. But in that scenario, if they own a vacation home, the vacation home needs to be turned into cash too, right? They need to sell the vacation home, pay the capital gain, whatever, turn that into cash and use it to buy an annuity. Well, for folks who really want to save that vacation home, and oftentimes the vacation home is the, the thing that they really do want to leave to the kids. Often the kids really don't care about the house, <clears throat> except on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket where I do work and then they really want to keep those houses. Um, but in, but in, in, in that case, you need to transfer the property. You'd need to transfer, in this case, the vacation home out and wait the five years. If you, want, if you didn't want to be faced with the possibility that if one of them needed nursing home care, you'd have to sell the house, okay? Finally, remember this? Remember the uh, tax avoidance trust? Remember we said that, that um, if um, we, we were doing this for tax avoidance purposes, and, and say we had put that into the will. We had said that there was going to be this trust uh, which was going to have $400,000 in it and, and uh, the rest of it was going to go to Mary. Remember, that was the situation um, to avoid the tax. Well, the problem with using this tax avoidance trust if we're trying to deal with mass health is that Mary just inherited $800,000. So if Frank died and Mary then needed mass health, that $800,000 would have to get spent down, right? Um, so the question is, can, can, you, can you structure a trust, a testamentary trust, that accomplishes the tax avoidance goals while at the same time protecting the assets if the surviving spouse needs mass health? The answer to that also is yes, um, but the trust has to look a little bit different. First of all, Mary in that case could not be the trustee. The surviving spouse can't be the trustee because, as I mentioned earlier, you can't have one of these trusts, an irrevocable trust, if the, the person whose assets you're trying to protect is the trustee. Second, um, you, would you would need to do something about that $800,000. The way that you could do that would be put by putting that $800,000 at the time of Frank's death into a separate trust, which we will call a marital trust um, for Mary's benefit. The only disadvantage to this is that the income from that trust would have to be paid to the nursing home, but the principal, the $800,000, would not. And upon Frank's death, Frank and Mary's death, all of the assets would be safe. That one's, that one's getting pretty complicated. I just wanted you to understand that it was possible to do those two goals at the same time. So in summary, there are three reasons why you may want to consider using one of these trusts. Um, probate avoidance, estate tax minimization, or a a asset protection for nursing home purposes. You can do two out of three. You can't do all of them at the same time. You can do estate tax minimization and asset protection, as I was just going through. <coughs> Excuse me. But you can't do those two things while at the same time doing probate avoidance. Because in order for the assets to be safe when Frank dies, they have to pass through a testamentary trust. They have to and therefore have to pass through the will, and therefore this has to go through probate. So you can do two out of three. You can also do estate tax minimization and probate avoidance because that trust, the estate tax minimization trust, as well as the probate avoidance one, doesn't have to be part of the will. So you can do two out of three. You just can't do three out of three. I know that was a lot of material, but I think I just wanted to give you that overview. When someone says, I think I really need a trust, the answer is maybe. You know, you really have to kind of talk that talk through that with your lawyer and then decide what kind you want. I'm just going to mention one other thing. Often, not a lot, a lot, but often, I am confronted with folks who come in who tell me they're older, um, they're worried about nursing home care, but they're, but, they're, but they're told me they're safe because they have a trust. 
And I'll, and I'll say, well, what kind? And then they bring it in. And it turns out that what they have is a probate avoidance trust that they had done when they were younger in order to avoid probate. It made perfect sense, and it still does. Except that, remember, in that probate avoidance trust, they kept control of their assets. That was the point, that they were keeping control. It was revocable. It was amendable, which means it also provides no protection for mass health purposes. right? So the moral of the story is, once you have documents in place, every once in a while, check in with your lawyer. right? See if either the law has changed or your life has changed, and maybe something has to be done differently. Uh, if you thought this was a lot of material and want to see it again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Uh, or the folks who are at um, Hopkinton Cable TV are kind enough to be here today. We'll be showing this, and it's my understanding that programs on Hopkinton Cable are also downloadable. So you could just search and download this program anytime you wanted to. Any Yes. You can add your email on to that Thank you. As, as Cindy Cormier, who works with me, has been kind enough to mention, if you want email notices of these, then just there's a sign up sheet in the back. Any questions regarding any of this? Yes, sir. And then you, ma'am. And then we'll take other questions. Yes, sir. Okay, the, first, the question I have is if, if, if you want to give a gift to your family, mm -hmm. somebody in your family, uh, the probate of, of a will, do they have to pay on that gift, say $10,000? Do they have to pay? Taxes on that gift? Those, are really, those are two kind of separate questions. The, the first question is the, if, if there is a gift, if one, of the, if one of the adults makes a gift to one of the kids, do, is there, is there, do the kids pay a tax on that? Yeah. The answer is no, because the receipt of a gift is not income. Similarly, if you inherit something through the estate, mm -hmm. the receipt of, of, of assets through an estate is not income, right? Similarly, at, at the estate level, we talked about the fact that, that unless the estate is worth more than a million dollars, there's no estate tax on that estate, right? But finally, the question is, is there a gift tax? So let me give you two minutes on the gift tax, right? Because this just, people, very few people get this, okay? There is no Massachusetts gift tax. There is a combined federal estate and gift tax system. And the way that system works is that if you die with an estate of worth, worth more than $5.4 million, that estate is subject to estate tax. If in any year you give somebody $14,000 or less, or if you're a couple, you give them $28,000 or less, right? then that gift isn't reportable to the government. It just, it just is. If you give more than that in any particular year, which used to be $10,000 and now it's up to fourteen, dollars then what you're supposed to do is file a gift tax return with the federal government that tells them that you made this extra gift. And the reason for that is not that it that makes it tax, but that they then subtract that amount, the amount of the extra gift, from the $5.4 million that you're allowed to leave somebody at death. Right? Which means as a practical matter for federal purposes, this is an these are all irrelevant. It's all irrelevant. For Massachusetts purposes, the significance is if you make a gift that is more than that $14,000 amount, right, then that amount that you gave over the 14 is going to get added back in to your estate for purposes of calculating your Massachusetts estate tax. So if you're Frank and Mary in this case, and you say, well, geez, we've got a million too, why don't we simply avoid the estate tax by giving away $200,000 today, right? Well, if they gave it away today, Right? then each of them, if they're giving it to one person, could have given that person $14,000. So they could have given them a total of twenty-eight. <clears throat> the remainder, $200,000 minus that $28,000, though, is going to get added back into their estate for estate tax purposes right? when the second of the two of them dies. So in their situation, or maybe in your situation, if you're close to that million-dollar number and you're, looking, and you're looking to avoid the estate tax, that's the most sensible time to do gifting. Say you're in a million one hundred thousand dollars. Your your estate tax, <clears throat> and you're concerned about this estate tax, which would have been forty percent of that hundred thousand dollars, or forty thousand dollars, right? Um, if, on the other hand, you can get the estate down below a million dollars, the estate tax is zero, right? 
So by making the gifts, it, potentially you're saving a lot in estate tax, right? So that may be a sensible time for you to be saying <clears throat> to each of your children, to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., right? But remember, if it's Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and your husband and wife, you can give away $28,000 times three, you've almost given away your $100,000 in one year, <clears throat> right? Just as a thought. That answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, there, there was a lady right back there. It's not. Irrevocable trust, irrevocable and unamendable. That's what it needs to be. Irrevocable and unamendable. Okay? No. Any other question? If not, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be doing another presentation in a couple of months, and I hope to see you then, if you get a chance to come back. Thank you very much. Amen.